All right, thanks, John. Man, I'm excited about all the things that we have going on uh, here at Seed. It's, uh, things are, are beginning to, to get rolling, and it's, it, like I said, it's exciting. It's an exciting place to be, and uh, this is an exciting place to be on Sunday morning, and I'm excited to bring uh, the Word to you uh, together. Uh, this series started off, like I have freely admitted, a little slow, a little bumpy at the beginning, but each week it's gotten better and better and better, and we're looking at signs of the Messiah, and, and the first two weeks we looked at this, the sign that, that we were given was this child that was born in just very unique circumstances. We looked at that for two weeks in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. And then last week, we looked at another sign, which was a location, which is a place, Bethlehem, which just has tons of meaning behind it. Of course, the king should appear here because of the, the deep meaning behind Bethlehem. And so we looked at that in Micah chapter 5, right? And then this week, we're going to look at even another sign of the Messiah, and it's of a different type, so I'm excited to get into that. But before we do that, let's pray together. Let's pray the things that we're praying as a church. Um, I'm just going to lead you in that to remind you. This is what we're praying God uh, and asking God for, okay? So let's go to the Father, and, and then I'm also going to pray for the Webbers. They just sent me a request uh, because Keegan, they've had to take him to the hospital for our allergic reaction. So I'm going to pray for that as well. Father, we do come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And, and first of all, we do want to bring this request from, from the Webbers and, and just, just ask you, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would be with them as they go to the hospital with their, uh, with their little boy, Keegan. And Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to his body, that this allergic reaction or whatever that's happening within his body, that Lord, you would that you would uh, just help him, that you would heal him, that you would use these doctors and nurses to bring, uh, to bring healing quickly to his body. And we pray for mom and dad as they're concerned, um, and we pray that you'd be their comfort. And Lord, this morning we come and we continue to pray to you. And Lord, I pray that, that this prayer you hear on a regular basis from the people at Seed Church, and that is, God, we want to hear from you. God, we want to hear your voice. We want you to speak to us, and we're looking for wisdom. We're looking for direction because you are the head, and we're just the body. We need you. We need you to speak. So, God, we ask you to speak this morning. God, we we also ask you that you would give us opportunities to share the gospel with people who are around us. Lord, this is the, the holiday season. We're seeing our family. We're, we're connecting with friends, maybe virtually but, and on the phone, but, but there's still that connection. There's still an opportunity there, and I pray, Father, that you would give us courage, that you'd give us just the right words, that you would orchestrate these conversations to bring you into that conversation and declare the gospel of Jesus to them. God, we ask for that. And then, Father, we ask for your power, the power of God, to be demonstrated in this place and in us. God, we ask for your power to be working in us, transforming us, transforming our minds, transforming our hearts and our desires, Lord, that we can walk in a way that is worthy of the calling, this great calling of the God of the universe calling us to be sons and daughters. God, we want to be worthy of that. Change us. Work powerfully in us. And then, Father, again, work powerfully through your word as we proclaim it to others. God, we want to see lives transformed. We want to see the fruit of the gospel. Lord, please let us see it. Let us see lives made new, lives that were dead in their sins and transgressions. God, that's what we want to see, the power of God at work among us. And so we ask for that in the mighty name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so um, at the beginning of this study, we saw that, that Jesus is our hope because he is our Emmanuel, right? He is God with us. And if God is actually with us, there is reason for us to hope. That's what we talked about at the beginning of this series. And then the, the, the week that followed was this talking about Jesus, the Messiah, being our Prince of Peace. And he comes and he brings the shalom of God, which is this Hebrew word that means peace. And more than peace, it means for things to be restored to the way that they were originally. The way that God made them in the garden. 
when he looked down on his creation and he said, it's good. It's so good. It's tov in Hebrew. That's what he says. It's tov. He looked on it and said it's good. And, and that's, this is the kind of Messiah that is coming. He's a, he's a prince who brings this kind of peace and restores things to, way they, to the way they should be. And then last week we saw that he's where the joy is, right? He's where the ultimate joy is found in an ultimate Savior. And listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. What a blessed God is ours in Christ. What a blessed God is ours in Christ. He is a sea of never failing delights and a river of boundless joy forever, forever flowing on. Isn't that amazing? That is who Jesus is to us. And this week we're going to look and we're going to talk about how love has returned. The Messiah's appearance is a, is a sign that love has returned. The presence of God has returned. The presence of a God of hesed, which is a Hebrew word that means steadfast love, has returned to his people. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Remember last week as we looked into the the prophet Micah, and we kind of gave an overview of Micah, and how at the beginning it's kind of this prophecy of doom. But at the end, he he has these beautiful words that he wraps up that prophecy with, and, and here are they. He says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? Who is a God like you? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. That hesed. And it's, it's used almost 250 times in the Old Testament. And it refers to God's relationship to his people, his disposition towards his people, his hesed, steadfast love. Now, we're going to start this morning in the New Testament, and we're going to work backwards for a little bit, and then we're going to jump back into the New Testament again. All right? So this sign that we're going to look at this morning is unique, and, and it spans a time period greater than just the Christmas story, okay? So we're, it's, it's a little bit more elaborate. It's a little bit bigger, and that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of excited about it this morning, because it includes us as well. So let's uh, turn to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to read about this sign, okay? I'll give you a second to find it there. We're going to be flipping around in our Bibles today, which will be a lot of fun so we'll be there, we'll be in Isaiah, and we'll be in Malachi today. Yeah, that's right, Malachi. We're going to be in your book today. All right, so here it is, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. All right, so John the Baptist, this is who we're going to be looking at today as a sign of the Messiah. Now, John the Baptist is this messenger who runs ahead of the coming king, and he announces his coming. He prepares the way for the king to come, and he calls to the people from the wilderness, right? He's out in the desert. He's outside of town, and he's symbolizing, and it should, be, should have been something that, that triggered the, the Jewish mind to, to think back to their time in the wilderness and their departure from Egypt during the Exodus. And we're, when God called them out of Egypt and into the, to the wilderness, John calls them out to the wilderness, and he says, depart from your sin because there's this great restoration that's coming. There's this great salvation that's coming. And it's greater than, than, our, than our forefathers uh, hoped for in the promised land. This restoration, this promise that's coming. And he tells them that, that it's the kingdom of heaven that is coming. And he calls uh, those waiting the Messiah, he calls to them. And he calls them not just in his words, but in a demonstration of his life and his appearance. Remember? John the Baptist, he's wearing camel skin, and he's living out in the boonies. He hasn't showered for weeks. You know, he's eaten locust and honey and berries and things that he can find, right? He probably lives under this little, you know, I don't know, a little hut or something. He's like a hermit out there. 
And he's demonstrating and, and making this call in, his, in the way that he's living. He's saying, come away from society. Come away from the worldly values that you're, that you're in. It's comforts, it's status symbols. Come away, even from basic necessities, because there's something greater. There's something greater that I'm going to call you to. There's something greater that's coming. So we all know the story of, of John the Baptist. But what was his message, right? John the Baptist appears uh, in, in, in Mark 1, 4. It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness from sins. So he's saying, if you want to welcome this coming king, as I'm, as I'm making preparations for him, I need to get you ready. And the way to welcome this king is to repent of sin. The way to get ready for this king is to, is to start showing actions that are befitting of rep repentance. What is your life going to... It should look different because this king is coming. I, I think about that. I think about uh, that must not have been a fun message to have to bring. But you know what? Uh, people bring us that type of news all the time. Uh, you, you go to the... And, um, you think you're feeling fine, and he runs some tests, and he comes back, and he says, hey, I have some news for you that you need to be aware of. And sometimes hearing that news, it doesn't feel good, right? But we need to know that news, right? If, if we have a, if we have, well, you know, you, you have this, this, this uh, maybe you have this, um, this thing inside your body that you're not aware of he can see it he needs to let you know and that's a good thing but it's hard it's hard to hear that and I can imagine for the people who are listening to John it may be a little bit hard for them to hear his message but what's significant about John the Baptist and here's where we launch back ourselves back into the Old Testament okay we're going to look at at three Old Testament prophecies all referring to this coming of a messenger who will come before the king, all right? And these three prophecies are, one is found in Isaiah 40, one is found in Malachi 3.1, and then the third one is found in Malachi 4.6. So let's, uh, let's start with Isaiah 40. So if you want to turn in your Bible, I already have mine marked out so I can quickly turn there, but if you can go to your Old Testament and look at Isaiah 40, I'm going to begin reading in uh, verse 1. And, and, and here is a sign that God is returning to his people. Okay, God is returning to bring his people home. All right, and it starts this way. Isaiah says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill will be made low, and the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Man, that is so beautiful. And what does it mean? What does this prophecy mean? This prophecy is, is going out as the people are in exile in Babylon. And this prophecy is a, a prophecy of comfort to them. He's saying, saying your, your time of exile is over this prophecy calls Israel to remember how God led them out of Egypt. He went before them with a fire by night and a cloud by day, and he removed the physical barriers. Remember the, the Red Sea that was in front of them that prevented them from going on. He parted it, took it out of the way, and he led them through it. Right? This, is, this is the picture. So this passage envisions God returning to the land of Israel from far, far away. And he's, has, he's making travel preparations suitable for a king. He's making all the crooked places straight. And his glory is going to be revealed as he does this. Now, interestingly, between Jerusalem, which is home, and Babylon, which is where they're in exile, there's a huge desert in between. It's the Arabian Desert. 
And this is the location. This is the place where, where Isaiah is saying that God is going to return and he's going he's to make a highway back home. So if God has been gone, where did he go? Um, God chooses to allow his presence, this, this splendor of his glory, his radiance, to remain in the temple with the people of, of God for centuries. And yet after the Jews um, have determined in their hearts to continue in false, idolatrous worship, the presence of God did eventually leave the temple. And if you read Ezekiel um, chapter 10, you see this progression of the glory of God moving away from the temple. Now Ezekiel is this other prophet, and he's, he's prophesying during the time of Jeremiah. We talked about Jeremiah a little bit last week, how he told the people, hey, you know what? Uh, you were spared from Assyria. But if you don't turn, the Babylonians are going to come and they will take you off into captivity. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, they didn't like what Jeremiah said, so they actually threw him in jail uh, for a while. And he stayed there until the Babylonians came. When the Babylonians came and, and, uh, and invaded Jerusalem, they found Jeremiah in a prison cell. So they let him go free. They said, well, you must be an enemy of these guys who we just conquered, so we're just going to set you free. So he got to stay in the land. But Ezekiel, Ezekiel, different story, prophesying during the same time, actually got taken away into captivity. And there on the banks of the, I think it's the Chabar River, he sees this vision of God coming at the very beginning of Ezekiel. And God comes on, seated on his throne and there's cherubim and there's clouds and there's this great platform and these big giant wheels that are underneath it. And God comes in wrath there and he sees a vision of that it's terrifying it's terrifying and then Ezekiel in Ezekiel 9 uh, and 10 Ezekiel gets transported from actually from Babylon in the spirit he gets transported to Jerusalem to see a vision of the temple and he gets this tour of the temple and he sees all these these uh, idols in set up in, in the in the threshold of the temple right at the front door this, this idol to the goddess Tammuz. And, and he gets taken inside into the inner places of the temple and he sees all of these ab abominations that the priests are doing. And, and it's, just, it's just sad. So sad, the condition of God's temple. And then in Ezekiel 10, he witnesses God's presence terrible, glowing, shining like the sun, presence leave from the Holy of Holies, goes to the threshold, and it goes out through the eastern gate to the Mount of Olives, to the south and the east, and disappears into heaven. God leaves his people. The progression, that progression is important, so just remember that, because we're going to see maybe a glimmer of of God returning in that same kind of reverse fashion uh, in a little bit. But God's presence among his people was a sign to them that they belonged to God. God said, they shall be my people and I will be their God. So when God leaves the temple, it means that he's left his people. It means that as they go into exile, they're fatherless, they're godless, their identity as God's chosen people has been lost. And they must feel abandoned, rejected, confused. And so this prophecy from Isaiah saying, comfort, comfort my people, because I'm coming back and I'm going to make a way for you to come home. Isn't that beautiful? So beautiful. And I'm going to send a messenger. Okay, so let's look at the second one. Uh, Malachi 3, 1. So if you want to flip there to the book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. Um, one of my favorites, Malachi 3, verse 1, John the Baptist is a sign that God will actually return, not just to his people, but to the temple. And it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple, to his temple, 
and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so here's the problem. So, um, so the exile, this return happens, and the people of, of, of Israel, the people of God, actually do come out of Babylon, and they return back to Jerusalem, and they rebuild the walls, and they rebuild the temple. Here, but here's the problem. Even though they rebuild the temple, the glory of God never descends upon the temple like it did in 2 Chronicles 5 or in 1 Kings 8. When, when the, the glory of God fills the temple so much that the, the priests are having to bail out because there's, the smoke is just overwhelming. The glory is overwhelming and they, they have to get out because God's presence comes in. It's amazing, amazing. And, and the problem is, is that even after they rebuild the temple, it never does that. So Malachi says, behold, I'm going to send my messenger. <laughs> here's, a, here's a fun little Fun tip, right? Uh, in Hebrew, the word messenger is malik. Um, and then if you put the, 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 uh, the possessive uh, pronoun on there, the my messenger, it becomes malachi, right? So he's saying, behold, I will send my messenger, my malachi. And Malachi is the one who's say, saying this. So there's a little bit of a word play here. And of course, Malachi was his messenger as a prophet in the Old Testament. But he's saying, I'm going to send my Malachi, my, my messenger, another one, and he will prepare the way before me. Um, to a dispirited people, Malachi prophesies that God will indeed come to the temple, preceded by a messenger of the covenant. And those who receive this message will delight in that message. Now, not everyone who hears the message will delight in it, but those who receive it are going to delight in it. And John the Baptist is this covenant spokesperson. He reminds us here is that the long-awaited one, the one you've been waiting for, the Messiah, the one who's, who's coming to establish the kingdom of God and fulfill the ancient covenant promises, he's coming. And he's not just going to fulfill those ancient covenant promises, he's going to give you a new covenant. And this new covenant, that's been, that's been, there's been little glimmers of it in Jeremiah and in the book of Ezekiel. This, this new covenant that God's going to take their stony hearts, he's going to give them new hearts. He's going to write his law, not just on stone tablets, but he's going to write it on their very hearts. And they're going to be his people, and he is going to be their God. That is the promise if you continue reading in Malachi chapter two, or chapter three in verse two, it says, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when, when he appears, this messenger, for he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap or a washman's soap, you know, scrubbing out, it's like abrasive soap, that lava soap, you know? I always used to hate that as a kid because I'd start washing my hands and be like, ow, this is like, this, I don't have any skin left. This is the kind of, this is describing who uh, this, this, this messenger will come. This is his message. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. So, so awesome. So, so the message of this messenger, the message of John the Baptist is one of a refiner's fire a washerman's soap, an unpopular message, one that crushes its hearers with its convicting power and knocks out from under them their feet of hypocritical religiosity, which has become just commonplace among them. He's calling them home. This is, this is exactly who Israel needs to come and preach to them before the coming king. Let's look in Matthew. Let's flip back to Matthew chapter 3. Continue the story of John the Baptist. And actually hear the, the message that he preaches. Starting in 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them. You brood of vipers. That's harsh. He says who warned you to flee from the wrath of that is to come. There's wrath that is coming for you. 
Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the, at the root of the tree. Do you feel the urgency? And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there's one who's coming after me mightier than I. Notice he doesn't tell them who his name is. He just refers to him. But he's mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat from the barn into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. The winnowing fork was used uh, as they prepared the harvest. They would get a scoop of the, the wheat and the chaff and they'd throw it up in the air. And it was a tool used to divide these two things because one was valuable. The wheat was valuable. They wanted to keep that. But the chaff was just, they needed to get rid of it and they would burn it. And so here's the picture of John the Baptist it, with his message dividing those who would believe and repent and those who would resist the God of steadfast love. They resisted the God who comes with a covenant of grace. And this message divides them. Okay, let's move on to the third prophecy, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. All right, so let's jump back to Malachi should have just had you put your fingers in three different places in your Bible because we're just kind of going back and forth in, in these three different places. But Malachi 4, 5, and 6, this is, this is crazy right here. I, I love this. And he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. What? Uh, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So Malachi is a sign of a prophet like Elijah who will come and bring reconciliation, right? So, so let's talk about Elijah for a second because it's, it's like, oh, so it's, is it Elijah who's going to come? Because if it's Elijah that's going to come, then that can't mean that John the Baptist is the messenger. We're, looking, we're actually looking for Elijah. Okay, so... Um, Elijah, the, the, his name means, my God is Yahweh. That's what Elijah means, all right? And he's a, he's a prophet. He's one of the, the favorite prophets of the Jews. Um, and he's, he, he's supposed to come uh, before the, the Lord comes. And, and here's, here's, here's what, how, they, how they saw this. So during the Passover, um, Jewish people set out a place setting for Elijah because see he never died he was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire so they're going, well if he's still alive he could he could come back right so let's and if he's coming back before the Messiah let's set him a place at Passover we're going to set him a, a place setting we're going to put out a special cup of wine we're going to leave the door cracked okay for him to, to come in with the hope that if he comes the Messiah is close behind. Isn't that awesome? In fact, uh, <clears throat> um, they, they also see Elijah as, as a, a, someone who is an arbiter of, of disputes, as someone who uh, can reconcile discrepancies, even discrepancies in the holy books. That's, that's the kind of authority that, uh, that Elijah had. And it's similar to, to Moses, Moses and Elijah were these two figures in, in Jewish history that were really important. Both of them got to see the face of God, all right? Moses, as he went up onto the mountain, he comes down, his face is shining. He didn't have a face shield uh, in the way. My face kind of shines a little bit on, on, on video, uh, but it's, it's not like anything like Moses. Um, it's just catching the, the lights up there. Um, but Elijah gets to see God as well as he goes up on the mountain and, and, and God puts him in the cleft of the rock and then hides him with his hand as he passes by. And he gets to see, see God's glory, but only as much as he can handle. And, and that must have been amazing, amazing. But Elijah comes and uh, uh, he is just, he's, he's zealous for the law. He restores the law to Israel. 
Moses brought the law, but Elijah is the one who restores uh, the people to the law. And so he's zealous for God. His prophetic uh, nature has, is full of angst, and he has this existential loneliness and, and this intensity that is unmatched by any other prophet. But it really sounds a lot like John the Baptist to me. I mean, if you think about it, John the Baptist railing in the wilderness, just preaching repentance of sin. And then late, we, we talked about this, Danny brought it up uh, in our Thursday night group as we were sitting around the campfire, you know, about John the Baptist, you know, what he had this, he had this moment of weakness, you know, where he was in prison and he's asking Jesus, you know, are you the one or should we wait for someone else, you know, this despair that he felt. And, and it's just like Elijah in the desert, right after Mount Carmel, right? Right after he sees God answer with fire and burn up the, the prophets of Baal and the, and the offering. He goes off into the, into the desert, crawls under a bush and says, God, just, just take me out. I don't want to live anymore. They've killed off all your prophets. I'm the only one left. And God says, no, 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 Elijah, you're not. And he restores him. He restores him. In the same way Jesus restores John, he says, tell him what you've seen. Tell him that the blind see, that the lame are walking again. Signs that I am the one. I am the one. So, uh, in fact, Jesus says of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Elijah is John the Baptist. In fact, he goes on in Matthew 17, and he says, uh, uh, this is, this is the, the chapter of the Bible um, where, where John and Peter and James go up with Jesus to the mountain, and, the, and, and, and he's transfigured. And what does that mean? It means that space and time and reality is just torn asunder, and, and they can see the, the majesty of Jesus, his divinity on full display. And in the midst of that, the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. And then as the, Moses and Elijah actually appear there and they have this conversation with Jesus and the disciples are just watching and just going, oh my goodness, can you believe what's happening right now? They're just drinking it in. And so on the way down from the mountain, when Jesus is clothed back in normal Jesus on earth, walking around humanity. They have this conversation, and Elijah comes up, and Jesus says, when they're coming down the mountain, but I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased, so the Son of Man will also certainly suffer at their hands. So these three prophecies, and here's the wonder of it all for me, Here's, here's where I just, I just stand back in amazement. And I go, it's unexpected. So unexpected. How God fulfilled these prophecies. I just didn't see it coming. I don't think anyone in... You know, we, we, we read this and we go, oh, how could they, how could they have missed the, the Messiah? How could they have missed him? I think I would have missed him too. Because here's, here's the fulfillment in the New Testament, okay? John the Baptist does appear preaching repentance, okay? And he's like a crazy man, right? Living in the desert. People are curious to go out and see him. I think just because they're bored and they just want some type of entertainment. Let's go see the crazy guy out, outside of town, he, he's putting on a good show. Let's see what he does tonight, right? This is not the picture of Elijah that the people expected. This is not the guy that they were hoping would show up for Passover meal and sit down at their table. He stank. Can you imagine him coming in and plopping himself down? They would have said, excuse me, mister. That seat's for Elijah. You better get up, get out. Or let's talk about how God's glory is revealed in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, right? God's, his glory is revealed to shepherds in a field. 
And it's on full display. We sang last night in our carol time. We sang uh, Gloria in excelsis Deo, right? Glory to God in the highest. And this, is, this angel choir comes and the, it, the, the night sky is just lit up, right? And the glory of God is there. The thousands of angels sing. Can you imagine how deafening the sound of their song as they declared the glory of God had come? Where does it come? It comes just outside of Bethlehem, to the east, a place that's called Bayat Shehur, which is now known as the village of the shepherds. It's, a, it's an eastern suburb of Bethlehem. And, and in Hebrew, it means house of vigilance or house of the night watch. And very close to there are the fields that are attributed to Boaz, Right? The kinsman redeemer of Ruth. So in this place, come, the glory of God is, is, is just proclaimed to a couple of guys and their sheep. Unexpected. Or at his baptism. His baptism, he's, he's baptized by John in the river and a, a dove comes down. Doesn't happen for anybody else except for this guy who shows up one day, baptized by John, and this dove comes out of heaven, and this voice declares. Everybody hears it. This is my beloved son. This, this is the son of my love with whom I am well pleased. It's in Matthew chapter 3. Or, like we talked about the transfiguration, three guys get to see it. Three guys hear the voice say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It's not like the glory of God isn't revealed, but where it's revealed and to who it's revealed, we didn't see that coming. I thought he'd tear open the sky. The mountains would just melt before him. I mean, he could, he could have done that, but he didn't. And then this third way that this New Testament prophecies are fulfilled, God does return to his temple incarnated, okay? Remember, he leaves on a throne with cherubim and clouds and smoke, this platform and these giant wheels spinning. That's the way he leaves, but when he returns, he returns in, his glory, in the glory of incarnation, he comes just like us. He's, he's humbled himself. He's taken on the form of a servant. He's become just like us, lowering himself to be our perfect high priest, offering the perfect sacrifice of himself. Can you see how they would have missed his coming? It's completely not what they expected. But he does come back to the temple. Shortly after his birth, he's dedicated in the temple. He grows up. His parents take him back to the temple. They lose him for three days and find him where? In his father's house. And then, just before his crucifixion, he enters from the Mount of Olives through the eastern gate, the golden gate, the gate of mercy, right where his presence departed. He comes back. And he comes back not riding a war horse, but he's riding on a young donkey. See, love is returning. And the presence of God, the hesed, the steadfast love, is returning to his people. Now, listen. So the first signs that we looked at, this child born in unusual circumstances. Two weeks we talked about that. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9. Then we looked at the location, the sign. The location is this is where he's going to come. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And this week, the sign is a man. It's a messenger. John is a sign of the Messiah. Now think about that. Think about that. John knew this, and he fully embodied it. John goes before the Messiah, not to point to himself, but to point to Jesus. He doesn't mention him by name, but he refers to him as the one who comes after me, the one you've been waiting for. 
And I'm merely the one who prepare, prepares the way. He must increase. I must decrease. And wait till you see who I'm preparing the way for. He's going to blow your mind. And people looked at him like he was crazy. He was bizarre, a spectacle. People laughed at him. But he didn't care. He knew his life was meant to be a sign. So I wonder, I reflect that on myself. I think about John, this man who fully embraced this calling, this calling to be a sign of the Messiah. And I ask myself, am I like that? Do I deliver the message of God with urgency, passionately and joyfully? Or is this what we're doing, just some sort of superficial religion that tries to be cool or tries to be relevant and that serves my insecurity because I want to be liked by you? I want to look good. I want to be the hero of this story. Spurgeon says, superficial religion is always fashionable because it doesn't require self-denial. Let me say that again. Superficial religion is always fashionable because it does not require self-denial. Is that what I'm about? Or do I want to exalt the message and the one sending the message, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Man, Jesus, Jesus is the hero of my story. He is the hero of my life. He is the hero that I've been waiting for. Now, look, I, I feel like I'm, I'm getting to know you guys, right? In fact, uh, I practiced my sermons on Saturday night, and I was here w way late, like midnight last night. And as, I've, as I'm... As I'm preaching to this open room, I'm looking around, I'm seeing your faces, right? Because I'm, I'm getting to know you, know you by name, know your stories. And, and as I get to know you, I, I'm growing to love you. Because every good shepherd is, needs to love their sheep. And man, I love you guys so much that I want you to experience the steadfast love of God. And I want you to know the God who came for you. He came to lead you out of sin. And he's removing the barriers for you. He's going before you and he wants to establish a dwelling place with you and in you. But repentance is part of that. Repentance is part of the message that I declare. It's the message that you need to hear. It prepares your heart for the coming of this king. But it's not just me. Because the king has come, the Messiah has come, and he is looking for messengers to go out. And this is the mission of the church. And oh, I just long to be a part of a church where this mission is something that we do, that we stay focused on. Watching uh, Star Wars, the, the first movie uh, with Isaac uh, yesterday, and uh, as, they're, as they're going into the trench, have you noticed how long the trench lasts before they get to the place where they're supposed to shoot the photon torpedoes into the Death Star? It takes forever for, the, for them to get there. And... and they, the question came up, why don't they like, why don't they just like go in like right where they're supposed to shoot the thing? Why do they have to, why do they have to fly? And the guy's like, stay on target, stay on target, stay on target, you know? It's like, and that's how I feel. That's, that's how I feel about our church. It's like, stay on target. So what, what is our response to our culture? And whatever madness or craziness is happening? What's the, what's the response of the church? The response of the church is that we have a mission and we're going to do it. And we're not going to be distracted. We're going to go into all the world and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. Teach them to obey it. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that he has made us ambassadors for Christ. 
that Christ is actually making his appeal through us. He, the message that God is calling to the world is that the king has come. And he's saying, give him your allegiance. Now, just as a side note, and I've gone over a little bit, but here's how I'm going to wrap up. Isaiah 40, such a beautiful passage. And I have prayed this passage over people, people who are wandering, men and women who have wandered children who have wandered from their faith. And I've prayed, I've poured out my heart to God and I've asked him to come for them. And I've begged him to remove the obstacles from before them and to lead them home. I've asked him to send me before them and to call them to repentance. And I think, man, if I can leave you with anything, it's, man, that passage is powerful. Pray it. Pray it for those family members that you have who don't believe. Pray it for sons and daughters. Say, God, go before them. Remove the obstacles. Make the way clear and call them home. And send me, if if needed, send me. I end today like I always end. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Just going back to that time in the the, the, the wilderness, as the children of Israel wandered, they complained. They heard the voice of God, but they resisted it. And he's saying, don't be like that. So the question is, is he calling you today? Is God calling you? Is he speaking today? And if so, what is he calling you to? As you listen to his word, what is he calling you to? And what are you going to do? We're going to talk about that in a moment, but let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Man, it is just so packed with stuff. And, and God, as we read about John the Baptist, this sign, this person who was a sign, God, we would pray that you would make us signs, that, you, that the king has come. And now we are his church, and you've given us a mission, and you've sent us out. And God, we, I pray that we wouldn't be comfortable and stay at home. I pray that we wouldn't be comfortable and, and, and worry more about uh, our, the things of this world that, that distract us, even from our basic necessities, God, that you would be so important to us, that the message that you've given us is so important, God, that we're willing to go without. We're willing to be a spectacle. We're willing to be laughed at, God, because you are so great and you are the hero of our story. We want to exalt you with all that we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.